Well, welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, the British government has launched a new strategic defence and security review to be completed sometime in the autumn. And last week it announced the financial envelope uh, for defence spending for the life of this government. Um, and there's been much comment and analysis in the media. But we thought um, here at Arundel House that it would be useful to get uh, the perspective of some senior defence officials and practitioners who've actually all been involved with strategic defence and security, <coughs> security reviews and also um, lived with the implications of them. And we have three with us, and I'll introduce them um, in a moment. We, we should also be under no illusions that defence and security reviews are hard work if they're to be done properly, both in the government departments and across the government departments. But we'll hear from um, Lord Robertson of Port Ellen, who as uh, New Labour's first Defence Secretary in 1997-98, uh, provided over their, their um, strategic defence review, and of course also uh, led the MOD during the Kosovo War before having a distinguished career as NATO Secretary General. Uh, General Lord Richards um, was the UK Chief of the Defence Staff 2011 to 2013 who oversaw the implementation of the 2010 Strategic Defence and Security mm -hmm. Review, the MOD's role in which was masterminded by uh, Dr Liam Fox, MP. And you've seen their biographies on the invitation. Um, they're all great supporters of the Institute, and we're very grateful they could spare the time to be with us tonight. The form is they will each speak for a maximum of 10 minutes, and then there will be time for a question and answer um, and the meeting will end at half past six. So, Dr. Fox. Well, thanks very much. Um, of the, uh, in the title, Strategic uh, Defence and Security Review, the most important word is strategic, uh, and the one that usually gets the least attention um, and probably the least result uh, in the various uh, discussions that go on. And uh, what has struck me for a long time is that while the real world that we live in is hugely interdependent, and increasingly interdependent, the structures of government remain silo-based, uh, and it's very difficult to get uh, people in one part of government to properly focus on the risks that are run by others. And I think that's where this review needs to begin, with the big picture, and then work its way in. And for me, that in this interdependent world, the number of strategic threats we face are roughly categorized as uh, state threats, uh, and of that, the number one state threat to our security is Russia. And I think Russia has become an increasing threat. I think that is partly because of the behavior of Putin himself and partly because of what I would uh, characterize as serial appeasement um, by us. So when he had a cyber attack on Estonia, we did nothing. When he invaded Georgia, the Foreign Office forbade me to call it uh, an occupation. The what else you call it when someone has uninvited troops on your territory, uh, form them into bases and refuse to leave, uh, you tell me well, what your lexicon allows you to call that. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, a number of other uh, decisions that we, we took have led Putin to the view that uh, we wouldn't do anything uh, in relation to Crimea and Ukraine, and we saw the inevitable results. And in terms of the review, the most important part of that uh, in terms of our response is the maintenance of our nuclear deterrent. And I think that if uh, ever the case had been made for the need to maintain a nuclear deterrent, uh, it's there today. So again, we might want to discuss that. But after the, the states themselves, we've got the failing states uh, who provide the breeding ground for instability, which is uh, an indirect and sometimes export a direct threat to our security. We have the rise and the increasingly well-funded transnational terrorist threat. We've seen the rise of religious fundamentalism uh, and where that can take us in terms of its direct action and contamination in terms of our, our domestic security. And then two areas that maybe don't get talked so much about, the huge uh, and ongoing global financial imbalances which threaten uh, global financial stability with all the implications that has for uh, pretty much all of the above uh, that I've mentioned so far. And finally, um, the competition for commodities. And as the global population grows, uh, there is necessarily increasing competition for commodities, uh, one of the most important being that. 
Uh, and as I regularly point out, 48% uh, of all the people alive in the world today get their drinking water from a river that arises on the Tibetan plateau. So is China interested in Tibet, A, because of the Dalai Lama, or because it's the world's biggest resource for fresh water? Um, you tell me. And I think that you only by understanding how all these risks sit together can you come to a, a general picture of what strategic risk looks like. Now, when we started the last defense review, I remember, and David will probably remember too, saying, do we have a template for carrying out the review? Uh, and I, they said, well, what do you mean? I said, do we have a single piece of paper against which we can measure all the programs that we have? And uh, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do we measure between tanks and, and ships and planes what we should be spending a very limited amount of money on? And eventually, we, we had a, a template constructed, and it was constructed on the basis that column one was the proposal. Column two uh, said, what are the operational what, what's the cost? Uh, column three, what are the operational implications? Column four, what are the capability implications? And uh, what might we lose, and what might we fill the gaps with? The next column was regeneration, if we chose to take this decision, and we had to regenerate the capability. How quickly could we do it, if at all, and at what cost? And the final column, which brings me back to where I started, is, was real-world risk. What is the real-world risk that this program uh, is actually protecting us from? Because there are lots of real-world risks that we could be having a lot more programs for. And we're also going to, as we go into this review, slightly change our mindset, because up till now, uh, each review has been about how much capability can we buy, and increasingly we need to look at the threat that we face uh, from others who are not there to match our capability, but to prevent us from gaining access to our own capability. And that's particularly, of course, in, in the cyber arena. And it's going to be quite a difficult uh, call for the Defence Secretary to persuade, I think, uh, the different departments inside Defence that they're going to have to give up things they can see for things that they can't see, which are nonetheless uh, a vital part uh, of our defence armoury. Uh, the funding question has been touched upon. I won't say too much about that, except that 2% of your GDP on defence doesn't guarantee in any way, shape or form that you'll get good defence or that you're getting the right defence. Um, Greece has been spending uh, well in excess of 2% yeah. of its GDP, which I suppose should count as Germany's share, really. Um, <laughs> if we're being uh, honest on that, but uh, how, we, how we get value for that money is a much more difficult thing than uh, ring fencing uh, at, t at 2%. And uh, in any case, I happen to think the 2% GDP is a poor target to choose. Far better to have a total proportion of government expenditure, which is a more stable measure than GDP, which is a much more fluctuating uh, economic measure uh, in any case. But uh, the good thing is that the department will be starting this with... Uh, in a much healthier position without the massive black hole overhang that we started the last defence review with. So at least on a sound footing, the difficult decisions should be a little less toxic to swallow. Thank you very much. General Lord Richards. Right. Um, well, thank you very much. It's very good to be here in the IISS, the International Institute of Strategic Studies. So I'd like to start by echoing Dr. Fox's emphasis on strategy. Um, there could be no more appropriate place to do it. Um, and I know some of my erstwhile friends in the audience have heard me say this before, but it was Sun Tzu who said that strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory or success, and tactics without strategy is merely the noise before defeat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there's too, many, too much tactics in the world and not enough strategy and statecraft. And uh, in that respect, I think all of us um, are in the same place. Um, I, I, having said that, I absolutely welcome the government's commitment to spending 2% of GDP on defence. Uh, I would absolutely again echo what Dr Fox has said, that in itself it doesn't guarantee the sort of outcome that we may require, but it's a very, very good start. Um, and I know the Prime Minister personally has taken a lot of interest in making sure that the government has uh, made that commitment. And I know or equally well there was quite a struggle. Uh, so I think we're in a good place to start, but the real work now starts. Um, I'm going to just come up with... Um, they're, not, they're all linked, but a series of issues that I would like to see reflected 
in the work that the MOD and the rest of the government are now uh, beginning to get on with. Uh, a coherent national security strategy which should precede the SDSR that examines contemporary uh, challenges and proposes a proper strategy or strategies to deal with them is what I want to see first and foremost, and Liam has hinted at that, um, followed by an SDSR that properly reflects those challenges. There is a real risk that we sort of uh, pat ourselves on the back and think, well, 2% commitment means we've cracked the problem. Uh, we haven't. Um, the, as I said, the real work really starts. There is a real risk, I think, that the SDSR focuses on the armed forces required for some mythical conflict in the 2020s and neglects how to deal with today's wars. Uh, and the Prime Minister, no less recently, uh, said that this is the war of our generation in respect of ISIS. Uh, I want to see an SDSR that takes into account today's wars, not just conveniently focus on what, what might be the case uh, in the future. And I'll give you one example. The carriers may be a central feature of our defence strategy in the mid-2020s, uh, but are entirely irrelevant to today's challenges. Uh, they're just not there. Um, and we're talking about increasing the bombing effort, for example, uh, in Iraq and potentially over Syria. Um, I, I want to know how that's going to happen within a coherent military strategy, uh, not uh, too much focus on what might happen um, in the future. And I, when asked about this, I often say, colloquially and you know, not really too seriously, that do you think that Field Marshal Allenbrook in 1944 was worrying about what the armed forces would look like in 1960? He was actually fighting today's wars, and I want to see the MOD and the government and our allies come up with a proper coherent strategy that confronts today's problems. Um, in that respect, a very uh, well-respected uh, American general called H.R. McMaster that many of you will know was over here recently, and he, in more elegant terms, came up with what I have been saying for a little while, which is that mass matters. Um, that he, he basically said that the point where one can trade off numbers for technology has now been reached and we need to build up numbers again. So, for example, in the case of the Royal Navy, down to 19 escorts, that is too few. And having uh, been CDS as an army officer and wanting ships and aircraft normally uh, in, the, in the short term when a crisis hit me, rather than uh, soldiers, I want to see the SDSR address the, num the issue of ship numbers, and I want to see them address the issue of aircraft numbers. And it could well be that there's a lot of money freed up by the end of the five years in which GDP progressively grows. So I want to see how that money is going to be spent towards the end of the five-year period to compensate uh, for uh, shortage of numbers. And that would actually also include the army when and if, and I think I've described it as a brave experiment, the reserve study doesn't come up to speed and the absolutely vital 30,000 odd reservists who are meant to compensate for the 20,000 additional regulars uh, that we've lost uh, since the last SDSR, uh, I want to see uh, talk about how you may, the government may have to grow regular soldiers again because that sum hasn't worked out. And it's absolutely vital that the overall fighting power of the army is achieved. Um, and I am sure a lot of people will be watching very carefully to see if the reserve study um, does cough up. And if it doesn't, then I think the SDSR should at least, or if there's a risk of it, which it, uh, there clearly is, because it's just gone into the red category under the government's own definitions, um, then uh, we need to see how that w might be addressed. Um, numbers, going back to H.R. McMaster's point, um, if your opponents... Uh, are uh, focused on numbers, and um, I personally don't believe that China is a strategic threat, uh, but it's something one has to be out there, one has to be cognizant of, um, then um, numbers are their asymmetric advantage. 
Um, it may well be that numbers are uh, an ISIS advantage at some stage, if, and I'll come back to that. Um, the 200 UK trainers that we have now committed to Iraq, I can absolutely assure you uh, their hearts are in the right place and they'll do good work, but there's a real risk that they're lost in the noise of the scale of effort required to deal with ISIS. And so I, I would like to see... Um, how we're going to deal with ISIS and the scale of effort required uh, to be addressed. And I would say that our allies with us need to put in not um, 200 or 3,500 plus a couple, uh, you know, 1,500 more, which I'm told is what the Americans might be doing, but tens of thousands of trainers if that is what is required. And why do I say that? Because I personally, while the Prime Minister talks about um, a, 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 the war or struggle of our generation. Uh, others have also said it's going to take a generation to resolve. We don't have a generation to resolve ISIS uh, because as long as it continues to be deemed to be successful, uh, they will continue to draw more and more people to their banner. Uh, and those people will in due course come back to here amongst other countries as well as destabilize the Middle East. And therefore, we need to deal aggressively and quickly with ISIS, and that requires more trainers and potentially uh, uh, you know, more uh, combat uh, troops. I'm not going to say in the front line, but to encourage and to work as an example for our uh, essentially Arab allies. So I want to see how ISIS is going to be addressed in more detail. And, and an SDSR that doesn't do that, to me, is not an SDSR worth having because we're focused on the future as opposed to today's war. And, of course, it isn't an either-or. It's got to tr somehow do both. Um, nearly there. Um, Russia, China uh, absolutely have got to be reflected in the national security strategy. Uh, I think uh, they are future uh, issues on the whole of I accept the point about Russia and the, how we have allowed them to get into this, this position but that's a result of our inability to address the issue of Russia I think ever since the end of the Cold War actually it's been uh, not handled brilliantly and they've now, we've now got into this position we have um, but it's why another key part of the SDSR needs to be readiness um, and I'd like to see uh, something on how money will be spent, and I'm sure it will be, by the way, uh, on improving the armed forces' readiness. At the moment, uh, we can't put into the field uh, or in, on, to sea or into the air the sorts of numbers in the time frame that allows our political leaders uh, to respond in a meaningful way. It takes too long to put anything of any scale into the field. That's got to be addressed, and the GDP um, solution and decision um, gives us a, a real opportunity to do that. It would be better to imp increase readiness than of existing forces and buy uh, new stuff that is at low readiness. And I'm sure it will be addressed, as I say, but uh, we, need to, we need to see how it will happen. Um, the, diff the, the balance between soft power and hard power I'd like to see addressed in the national security strategy. What we want, and I'm sure people in Whitehall will be focused on this, is what I think conventionally might be called smart power. Um, there's too many people in positions of influence that think soft power can compensate for hard power. If you're in the Middle East right now, soft power is no, of no relevance whatsoever. And it's of very little relevance to people in Southeast Asia who are worried about what China is doing in the South China Sea, for example. It is of relevance in other parts of the world. But the idea that soft power will buy uh, Britain influence and prestige amongst our allies, I'm afraid, is way wider than mark. It's got to be smart power and appropriate power. Um, are we nearly there? I've got one more minute. Um, Okay, I'm nearly there. I, I, I'll miss out some of this stuff. Um, so what did I say? I said, finally, as I made these notes on the, in a taxi on the way here, uh, I said to my, mo finally, and most importantly, uh, what gives the British Armed Forces their edge, um, person for person, is the quality of our people. I want to see how we are going to preserve the quality of our people. I see... Kit. I saw Kit, and I still see it. I travel a lot. I saw the most wonderful aircraft sitting 
idle on airfields. I saw the most exquisite technology in ships that couldn't get out the sea because the people who owned them didn't know how to run them, and they certainly didn't know how to link it all up with air and, and land, for example. And I saw some very fine tanks sitting in tank ships who were utterly useless operationally. It's the British Armed Forces, the people, that is our edge. And I want to see how uh, the government will look after them and make sure they real, feel really valued. That pulls the quality all the way through to the top so you don't end up with an old fart like me, the Chief of Defence Staff. Thank you very much. <laughs> and after that, Lord Robertson. OK, can I start by agreeing uh, with the other two speakers on the fundamental, which is that this review <clears throat> has got to be strategic. Um, it's almost a given, and yet it's not necessarily going to be what will happen. I think this review is probably the most important uh, in a generation. Given the nature of the threats that we face, uh, uh, both domestically uh, as a spillover from what's happening abroad and in the international space. Getting this right is going to be of crucial importance to future generations. And that's why I believe it's got to take time. It has got to be properly and thoroughly done. It's got to be done realistically, and it's got to be based uh, on a foreign policy baseline that takes account of all the elements of our security and not simply one or two of them and the least effective review will come if it is dragooned by the Treasury. If it starts off on the basis that money has to come out of the defence budget or to stay in the defence budget but spent on the wrong things, then you know, it shouldn't really be done uh, at all. Um, the Foreign Office uh, has got to be involved because defence and security is not simply a matter of the hardware or even the software or the people in the armed forces. It's about a blend and a mixture, mixture of all of us, uh, of all of those things as well. Uh, and a situation where the increase in our aid budget last year, the increase was more than the whole of the Foreign Office budget, makes no sense at all if you're talking about strategy for Britain and where Britain wants to be uh, in the future. And we need to know that. There needs to be a consensus, a national consensus about the role of Britain in the world, how it defends itself, where it wants to be, where it wants to locate itself. And that is a fundamental at the beginning of the review. The review that uh, I supervised in 1998 um, had an introduction by me where I said this, and it's worth, you know, this is 17 years ago. The review is radical, reflecting a changing world in which the confrontation of the Cold War has been replaced by a complex mixture of uncertainty and instability. These problems pose a real threat to our security, whether in the Balkans, the Middle East, or in some troubled spot yet to ignite. If we're to discharge our international responsibilities in such areas, we must retain the power to act. Our armed forces are Britain's insurance against a whole variety of risks. So it was true 17 years ago, and it's true absolutely today. And the last review, and I don't want to have a battle across the table with William, unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, unfortunately, uh, was wrong-footed by circumstance. It focused. Um, on 2020 and did not foresee what was going to happen in Libya just a short time after that, what Russia was going to do in a change of its foreign policy, uh, the rise uh, and emergence of, of ISIS, the problem in the Mediterranean of large numbers of migrants entering uh, Western Europe, the Ebola crisis in Western Africa, uh, the rise of uh, Argentinian nationalism and the renewed threat to the Falklands and of course the militarization of China. None of these things played a part in that because they couldn't. They weren't there at the time. They, have to, they had to take account and we have to take account of jihadism, of global terrorism, of uh, the rise of nationalism and separatism and religious fanaticism, of piracy, of organized crime, of pandemics, of uh, of climate change, uh, of cyber threats. 
and of fragile and failed states. These are the lingering and continuing problems. But the one word that really has to stay in our mind all the time is the word surprise. We were taken by surprise when the Argentinians invaded the Falklands. We were taken completely by surprise when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We were taken by surprise when the, the Berlin Wall collapsed with all of its knock-on effects. We were taken by surprise in 9-11 when uh, the homeland of the United States of America w was attacked. And we don't know where the next surprise is going to come to. And that's why this mixture of flexibility, readiness, and capabilities matters. So I, I commend the government for its pledge in the budget to, to adhere to the 2% of GNP that the Prime Minister championed at the Newport Summit. I think it was going to be a profound embarrassment to this country and, and a real downgrading of us had he not kept up with what he had said was the key criterion there. So that's good. I hope it's not creative accountancy. I put down a, a few parliamentary questions in the House of Lords this week just to ask what new items were going to be counted in the defence budget that were not there before, whether army pensions and... Uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I suggested to one minister one day that by some freak of chance, the American <laughs> defense budget includes their blood transfusion service. And I saw his light, his eyes light up <laughs> when I said it. So we need, we need to watch that. And, and as Liam Fox rightly says, the 2% is only one criterion and not even the best criterion of, uh, of, of military strength. Uh, capabilities matter much more than that. And when I was in NATO, I kept lecturing people about that. 2% spent on the wrong capabilities mm. is as bad mm. as no money being spent, or limited money being spent on the, on the right ones as well. So a blend of all of the different departments is going to be absolutely essential to get the right outcome. My second point is I want something left out of this strategic review, and that is our trident deterrent. All of the political parties believe in deterrence. All of the political parties were committed to the renewal of the submarines, because that's what we're talking about. We're not buying a new system. We're, buy we're building four new submarines. And there is a commitment by the official opposition and by the Conservative Party to building the four. So it doesn't need to be and should not be in this defense review. It wasn't in the one we did in 1998, because it was deemed to be out with that, uh, and, uh, and the manifestos of the political parties in the election have now made it such as that. The deterrent is a deterrent. It is not a military weapon. It's a political weapon. It is there to make sure that other people don't act against us, and therefore it should be out of this review, and we should make that clear right at the very, at the very beginning. I think another fundamental in the review has got to be widespread consultation. I have to tell you that at the time when we were doing our review, uh, it was exhausting and it was frustrating um, and it was pretty painful to do all the consultation that we did with almost every stakeholder in the defense field. We consulted <coughs> them all. And even when we broke the chain of command for the first time in military history and said that individuals in the armed forces could give their views, uh, and they didn't. Uh, we sent out a team to make sure that we got their views as well. And out of that came a number of interesting ideas that were incorporated in a multifaceted report at the end of the day. But much more importantly, it bound in people. It brought people in to the process. And that is critically important. There is no point in producing what is a national strategic and defense review if people believe that it is fundamentally flawed and that they were that they were never even consulted about what should be in it. And I think that's got to be important as well. My final point is that we have to look at force, force multipliers. Um, we are members of the most successful defense alliance that has ever been on this, on this planet uh, in, uh, in NATO. And we're major players inside NATO. And I think our reputation inside it now with the 2% to be adhered to will be will be recovered uh, from there. But it is inconceivable that we will be engaged in any conflict in the world in the future 
that does not involve allies or where we have to have a full spectrum of uh, capabilities. We can't afford full spectrum uh, in any event. Uh, uh, and even keeping the key components that we require is a major task. And I remember the battles that I had with Gordon Brown uh, over, uh, uh, over that at the time. But we've got to make sure that NATO is fit for purpose. And a policy of zero nominal growth uh, for NATO's civil budget is frankly ridiculous. At a time when every NATO summit adds new obligations and new responsibilities on the alliance, to hold the budget to zero nominal growth is simply irresponsible. Uh, if people knew how few people were employed in the civil side of NATO, they would be absolutely astand uh, 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 astounded at that. A tiny group of people at the heart of this great military alliance, and we need to do it. And finally, and I'll probably disagree with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Liam here, we need to use the European Union. The European Union is pretty feeble in military terms. It's all, it's all wiring diagrams, but they're not necessarily connected up to the proper capabilities, but they add value. They are an essential part of the way in which we're going to be able to tackle the sort of problems like the migrant crisis that might affect us uh, in, the, in the future. And 17 years on from the San Malo Agreement, there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that our allies in the European Union recognize that the European Union has got a role in the future. Another American general I like to quote was General, general Marshall, uh, both a great military general and also the architect of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, said the best way to win a war is to prevent it. So preventative diplomacy mm -hmm. must be at the heart of this review. And the diplomacy must have the resources in order to make sure that Britain can both stand proud in the world, achieve its objectives for what it wants to do, and to be effective in what it needs to do in the future. Thank you very much. And could I thank all three spe speakers for sticking to the time limit, but also a very rich dart and subject matter that really complements each other. Uh, we'll now go to the discussion, um, and in a moment I'll invite those of you who want to contribute to catch, catch my eye. Um, the meeting has to end at half past six, so I'd ask you all to be very brief and to the point um, so that we can give the maximum number of people. And I think what I'll do is we've got um, three speakers, is I'll take questions or points in groups of three, uh, brigading them together. There's a gentleman right on the front right there. IISS member Vipul Thakur, three brief comments. We require 2% of GDP for defense, but that has to be real, no accounting tricks. And I'll quote three brief examples. We are planning for aircraft carriers without fighter jets. That's not good enough. We attack Libya with France, but we couldn't have done it without help from USA. And only yesterday, the RAF temporarily halted bombing missions against Islamic State as two missiles fell off one aging aircraft at Cyprus base. That's ridiculous. Uh, gentleman in the purple shirt, thanks. Uh, Michael McLean, Montrose Associates. Uh, to what extent will this strategic review be different from its predecessors insofar as we can't rely on the uh, US leadership strategically, which has been axiomatic for the past two generations, and what conclusions might flow from that. Thank you. Very good question. And the gentleman in the white shirt next to it. <coughs> James Hurst from BFBS and Forces TV. Uh, Lord Richards, you particularly referred to the importance of the quality of people. Uh, I wonder if you have any concerns that in the financial settlement there seems to be a, a straitjacket that allows for investment in equipment but has things like pay rises capped when people have seen pay fall in real terms and when allowances were reduced as part of the financial progress last time, uh, whether you feel there is room to a actually uh, invest in people? Um, i just add to that that we published on the ISS Voices blog recently some immediate commentary on the government's announcement last week. And it seems to us that about 70% of the defence budget is internally ring-fenced it, itself. Um, perhaps I'd ask 
Bill Richards mm -hmm. to go first. Well, James, on yours, I mean, I, I think I made it clear that I think there does need to be flexibility on people. Um, you know, the, the one thing I most remember from being Chief of Defence Staff is the people and gain a visit, air station ships or battalions or whatever, you come away with such a buzz. And uh, I, I don't want to overflog it, but um, there are armies, navies and air force in every country in the world. Very few stitch it together like the British Armed Forces can, and it's because of the people. Um, um, you know, I said, you see Kit idle all over the place because they haven't got the quality people. And I don't really think, um, as much as they say they do, I don't think our political masters really understand the complexity of our business and the requirement for quality people. I don't think it's all about pay, um, uh, you know, but it is a bit about pay, and I certainly think there should be some flexibility in that. And there has been, actually, over the last five years, the armed forces got treated more generously uh, than the rest of the public sector. But my argument as CDS was they're not the public sector, they're the armed forces, and they bloody well deserve it. So I'd like to see more of that, uh, but I think we have in the government someone or, or people who are instinctively sympathetic, but they, they need to understand the linkages better. Um, but training is very important, um, missiles that don't drop off planes, um, they need to know the kit is good and they've got what they need to go to war with in a hurry. Um, so it's not just pay, but it's a package that is people focused and I'm confident that the Secretary of State for Defence understands that, but I want to see it written down and reflected in the policy. Dr Fox, do you want to say anything about the questions? Yes, uh, I think there's a, I, I agree very much with David. There's a real problem with this internal ring fencing <laughs> inside departments. It, it restricts flexibility where flexibility is actually required. I'll give you one example of that, which is on this pay. If the government's economic program goes to plan and employment in the country continues to rise, uh, on a 0.5% real growth, in the defence budget, at least a proportion of that would be required to deal with what would then become a recruitment and retention mm -hmm. problem. Um, the uh, armed forces have to compete for labour with the rest of the economy, and that's to, so to ring fence a part of that doesn't necessarily take into account the reality of what will be faced. Um, the platform numbers matter, and in terms of uh, how many F-35s we're going to get, uh, how many and how quickly will be one of the key decisions. Uh, as to, and also when tornadoes retire, these, these will be linked decisions uh, and they're not going to be very easy because they're going to have a lot of losers. Um, on the question of American leadership, uh, yes, that would be nice. Um, uh, and uh, what we can say for certain is that there's going to be a different administration. In my view, any administration is likely to give more uh, American foreign policy uh, guidance than we've had uh, in recent years. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is to change some of our more absurd policies ourselves, uh, such as uh, our nonsense, militarily nonsensical policy of bombing ISIS, but only in Iraqi territory and not across the non-existent and, and, and imagined border uh, in Syria. Uh, this is one of the daftest policies I've, I've, I can never remember. Uh, and I think the House of Commons will be want, wanting to come back to deal with that. And the final thing is priorities really do matter. And it's just worth pointing out to this audience that last year we spent more money on the elderly heating allowance uh, in the United Kingdom than we did on GCHQ, SIS and the security service combined. Discuss. Lord Robertson, any, anything to add on those three points made from the floor? Mm -hmm. no, I think the, the Michael McClay's question about you know, the Americans uh, is, is very important. And that's, that's one of the changes that is going to be required from previous defense reviews because although, as you said, the Americans gave some assistance in Libya and it was actually crucial at the beginning, they also pulled right back and took their military commanders out of the NATO military structure, something that was, that was almost beyond uh, anybody's experience. Now, when I used to be asked about European defense and why should there be a European defense component uh, a la the San Malo Agreement, I said there will come a day when the Americans say this big problem that has arisen is your problem, that you've got a quarter, a, a third of global GDP just like we have, so it's in your backyard, you sort it, we're standing by. And everybody said it won't happen. The Americans won't allow that to happen. But actually they took their commander out of Naples, out of uh, Allied Forces Southern Command, AF South. They took their commander out and handed it back to, 
to a, a NATO commander, happened to be a Canadian, um, but that was something that was uh, quite <coughs> exceptional as well. So we need to therefore build on the alliance, we need to build also inside the European Union to make sure that collectively we've got the capabilities that can be used. And it's pointless having an, uh, a, a military mission like Libya, authorized by the North Atlantic Council, where half the members of NATO don't participate in that and the Americans stand back from it. That is not acceptable and therefore we have to build that into, mm -hmm. in, into, the, uh, into the future as well. On the question of people, the people are extremely important. And I think I said in the last review, if we ask our forces to fight, we must be sure they will win. It's a sort of basic sort of principle that needs to be there. But the ring fencing thing is becoming, as Liam uh, and David have said, a big problem. The Prime Minister announced yesterday or the day before he wanted to see more special forces and more drones. But the special forces are the elite component from a large quantity of individuals who are in the different services. If you reduce the pool, the effectiveness of your special forces goes down. So sort of making this grand theatrical statement, which everyone will applaud, belies the fact that you're only guaranteeing an army of 83,000 people, and out of them, you've got to try and produce an elite, and that's not going to be an easy, an easy thing to do. And a short supplementary from Lord Well, Richard. on that latter one, um, of course, uh, I think they've, they probably already got it, but it's been, they have been reminded. So I think we will see correctly a greater investment in SF enablement um, because they can't get more numbers. It's a fact. In fact, the numbers are coming increasing a problem, but they do need airway refuelers, more ice star and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's where they get around. It's on Michael's question. Uh, typical Michael question, um, very good one. Um, I, I, I uh, also think in an ideal world like Liam that we need to see more American leadership. Um, and they might argue that at the moment they have demonstrated over what the, they've done uh, with us and others over Iran. And, and I think that is an example of American leadership, whether you like it or not. But like George has said, um, it's not always going to be possible. And I uh, haven't, I've only seen some of the, uh, the, the web, but um, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs talked about three priorities. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain there wasn't a fourth. It was Russia, China, uh, and ISIS. And I think there might have been a fourth. The fact is, if it all happened can, at the same time, they can't lead in, each, in, in three or four areas. And others must be prepared to stand up. Um, and it may be coalitions of the willing. I would personally like to see the British uh, be prepared to lead um, with American support, uh, or maybe it'll have to be the French. And, and we somehow lost the confidence it would appear to maybe do that. We always look to the Americans. Well, I think that is a dangerous assumption in the future, and, and I'd like to see the SDSR address the issue of command and control uh, because I think that is the single most important enabling capability that we consistently uh, underestimate uh, the importance of. Thanks. Time marches on, so I'm going to take some questions from the left-hand block. First of all, Brigadier Donald Wilson, halfway down on the edge. Thank you. I'm Donald Wilson, Defence Consultant. Um, Lord Richards talked to, um, about soft power, uh, I think in quite a sceptical way, and particularly its relevance to some of our problems at the moment. Do you think that the UK foreign aid budget should continue to be ring-fenced and perhaps uh, made available for other higher priorities? And there's a gentleman a couple of rows behind him with a beard. Hi, uh, Alex Elliott, MBDR UK. Um, I was just wondering, Lord Robertson, you mentioned the, um, the role of the European Union in combating Russia. I was just wondering, could you expand on that maybe and say what directly action you would like to see done to prevent them, especially when the sort of soft power approach might not have seen the effectiveness that we perhaps would have anticipated that it would have. And then there was someone in the middle of the block, I think. Yes, he's got his hand up. Uh, Michael Arthur, now with Boeing. You <coughs> all three very clearly articulated the threats around us. And George Robinson made a very telling point, I thought, on saying we need a national consensus on our role in the world. In the last election, none of the leaders articulated a clear view of our vision in the world and it was a very internally looking debate. Has public opinion lost its way and lost its will? And if so, what should we do about it? Well, perhaps if I could turn to the two politicians here first, uh, Lord Robertson. Well, public opinion 
gets laid, should be laid, um, and there's a failure by all of the present political leadership, frankly, to face up in public to the sort of dangers that we face. So we, we move, you know, the spotlight goes from migrants in the Mediterranean to Iran and then to, you know, to ISIS, you know, and it moves around all of the time, you know, but people need to be told that this is a complicated, difficult, and increasingly dangerous world. And that although these problems are far away, they can come very close to us very quickly indeed. Mm. So the ISIS recruits who go out there and become bloodthirsty jihadists are going to come back, and some of them are already back in, the, in, the, in this country. So the idea that it's a faraway place and we don't need to bother about it is a, is a very simplistic view. But unless the, politi the political classes make that absolutely clear and make it clear that there are no simple or cheap answers to national security and to protecting people in this country, then we will continue to have declining defense expenditure right across Europe today. On the, on the question about what the EU uh, can do in relation uh, to Russia, well, up to now, it's been soft power that has been used, whatever you know, Liam says about sort of backing down in the face of things in the past, but it was a, uh, President Hollande and Chancellor Merkel who faced up to, to President Putin uh, and President Poroshenko uh, to deal with the Minsk agreement. Why the hell we were not there, since we are signatories to the Budapest mm -hmm. Memorandum, which <coughs> guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, the territorial integrity uh, of, uh, of, U of Ukraine and in return for them giving up their, their <coughs> nuclear weapons capability at the time. I don't know. We should be there, and we must be there. But I think that the, the soft power of the European mm -hmm. Union and the, and the uh, the action service, the, inter the international action service, is an area that you can multiply. President, uh, President Obama decided that Iran was to be dealt with through diplomacy, and I think he's actually got a very, very good outcome, which I think is going to hobble some of Iran's ob uh, ambitions in the future and perhaps bring them into a more civilized attitude to the, uh, to the, outside, uh, the outside world. The aid budget, by the way, for that person who asked the question, is now enshrined not just in policy, but in law. There is now, there is now an act of parliament uh, supported by the last coalition government, which makes it obligatory for 0.7% of GNP to go on the, on the international aid budget. And it would require an act of considerable political capital to repeal that act, which is the only way that you can translate the funds into the defence and security budget. Dr Fox. Um, yes, I didn't vote for the 0.7% being enshrined yeah. into law, so I think that probably answers your question. <laughs> um, and in any yeah, case, any fool can spend 0.7% of your GDP, whether you get anything for it and whether it actually achieves anything, is a very different question. Um, and uh, exactly what our priorities on, on development are uh, is, a, is a totally different subject. Uh, on the question of public opinion, public opinion moves very quickly and is very fickle. And the questions that politicians should be asking today are the questions that the public af ask the day after the disaster and say, why didn't you? Um, they, that's where we need to be. Uh, and if all we're going to do is reflect public opinion, we might as well give up and let Maury run the country um, if we don't want to be showing any uh, real leadership. Um, I, I do t naturally do take a slightly different view on the EU from George, um, but I, I think the problem uh, is that our European, our European continental allies, under whatever label they want to think of themselves, are not doing enough. They're not spending enough, nor do they show sufficient commitment. And there's no point in actually having the capability if you don't have the pol political will to use it. We saw that with Germany um, over what happened uh, in Libya. And uh, one of the one of the prime ministers of one of our European uh, allies said at, at a meeting was in, is in India, he said, you know, I don't think our country is particularly well suited for war fighting. I think we're much better suited for peacekeeping, which I felt I had to point out to him that you can only be a peacekeeper if there's a peace to keep. And sometimes you have to fight for that, uh, and you might have to die for that, and you certainly have to spend for that. And the, the trouble is that too few of our continental European partners uh, are, are living up to the expectations that we have a right uh, to expect of them. And the trouble that I see with the European Union is that some of those who already don't spend enough in their obligations for NATO 
might see the EU and the softer elements of that uh, as, a, as an easier option and leave the rest of us uh, holding the baby, as it were, militarily. And that's, that's a real risk. Um, on Donald's, uh, very good to see you again, Donald. Um, uh, on the ring fencing, the aid budget in law, uh, in a way, I wouldn't have voted for it, but it's an our fact. And so we've got to make it work, because I don't think it will be repealed. Um, so that is why I place considerable emphasis on the national security strategy, because I want to see how smart power will better influence um, our, will better enable our influence in the world. Um, and, you know, properly spent, I think it has a big role potentially. Uh, and I'm sure that the Secretary of State for DFID, uh, you know, understands that. But it must reflect foreign policy. Uh, not be a separate arm of government uh, and that's to where the risk lies at the moment we, they went off and did whatever they did whether it mattered to to us as a country whether it was in our vital national interests or not but I, I'm content or convinced they understand that so we're where we are we now got to make it work why the national security strategy is so important um, on Michael's uh, question I, I agree absolutely with George and Liam I mean on the issue of ISIS, I was giving something, a, a talk at a literary festival the other day, and I didn't know that there was some media in the audience, and you know, what I was saying in the context of ISIS is we need a scale of vision, a scale of statesmanship, of commitment that we, w that was required to fight World War II, and that's what I would say Britain could do now in the context of ISIS. Uh, we have a very successful Prime Minister with clear leadership skills. Uh, I'd like to see us now lead uh, a, a movement that combines um, many, many nations to fight ISIS properly. Uh, and I think that should be reflected in the, um, in the national security strategy and then in the SDSR. Uh, you know, our moment in the sun may be here because no one else is going to do it. Uh, and our Arab allies, by the way, we all rightly focus on ISIS people coming back here. Can you imagine our, the Gulf and the Middle East increasingly destabilized by ISIS? That is going to be very, very difficult for us all. So this is not just urgent from a British domestic point of view. This is urgent from a genuinely geostrategic perspective. And we need to get on and deal with it. I've got five people who've caught my eye. What I propose to do with the agreement of the panel is briefly ask all five to make their short contributions, and then the panel can address any of those they see, they see fit and make any concluding remarks. First, Tim Fish in the front on the right. Uh, Tim Fish from <coughs> Shepherd. Um, you, you mentioned quite a lot about getting the strategic defence review done properly. Um, is enough time being devoted to do that? Um, because it have to come out before the comprehensive spending review. So is that time frame not realistic to do it properly? And what sort of stages do you have to go through to do it properly? OK, then I'll take home Johnny Barron in the middle of the right-hand side, and then the gentleman on the aisle in the same row. Uh, Johnny Ryan from the Royal College of Defence Studies. Uh, the, the question is about how we establish and agree the place of Britain in the world, which the NSS should do. Uh, because it seems to me that in the past, if we were punching above our weight, uh, which could suggest a lack of resources for our level of ambition, uh, we now, even with reduced resources, seem to be punching below our weight. Um, how do we get that sort of Goldilocks uh, appropriate uh, ambition and resources? And then the gentleman on the aisle. Thank you, James Roberts, uh, the tablet uh, Catholic paper. Uh, on this question of, uh, of public opinion, just to take it a little bit further, uh, how do we get politicians to be uh, more robust in their defense of defense, uh, if you like? Uh, is, there, is what's happened in America over the past few years not uh, seriously undermining uh, that kind of attempt, the, the U.S. administration over, the, over recent years? And then the lady in the aisle, just by him. Thanks. Uh, Laura Schofield from the Royal Society. We know that the National Cyber Security Program is due to finish next year. Um, I just wondered if the panel had any views on whether this should be renewed, and if so, what sort of scale that should be on. Very pertinent question. Thank you for that. And I think there's a gentleman in the second row. Uh, High Commissioner of Cyprus, how does one predict the unpredictable to address it? Why do we always seem to be running behind events and being surprised constantly by e.g. ISIS? Didn't we see ISIS coming? 
didn't, I mean, it obviously needs money, it needs command control communication, it needs methodology, all these things. Is it a matter of putting more money in intelligence? And, and, and why are we always seem to be running behind events than being in front of them? I know it's, sorry for being so basic, basic mm -hmm. but uh, all these things that you addressed, uh, Lord Robertson, could have been predicted. And, and we haven't well, done it, and um, which, which then makes the war okay, much Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw the line there. Um, and we'll go in the same order that, that we began. And I'd ask the panellists, if they, once they've tackled any of the questions that they want to, if they've got any uh, concluding remarks if, if about anything, um, they're welcome to make those as well. Uh, Dr. Fox? Um, yes. Uh, how quickly can the SDSR be done? Well, that depends how much preparation has already been done uh, before, the, uh, before the election. And uh, I'm, there are people in this audience today much better placed uh, to be able to answer that question. Um, but uh, it's the fact that it's on a five-year cycle gives it much greater predictability, and it should really be a rolling program uh, that enables us to take a constant uh, look ahead. Cybersecurity, uh, I actually would, would, if it was left to me, I would have a slightly different structure. I think the, the way in which uh, Whitehall is structured is not uh, best placed to deal with that. I think that uh, there should be a, a proper national security advisor, uh, the head of the uh, NSC, who is a senior politician answerable in the cabinet, and I would take cybersecurity in there uh, rather than have it uh, fragmented across Whitehall. I think it needs to have a central, a central direction in that. Uh, the question on, on our Arab allies, um, uh, we hear a lot that we are doing the second biggest number of strikes in, in, uh, against ISIS after the United States. It's worth pointing out America does 92%, we do four, and the rest of everybody else combined is four. So just where our Arab allies are in this particular battle, which is theirs? This is their territory, this is their region. They need to step up to the plate and do more. And it was a very pertinent question about how ISIS came about. They are very well funded, they have a very complex uh, communication strategy. They didn't happen overnight. Um, and one of the places that we need to be looking is not just in terms of what we deal with ISIS militarily, but the financial flows, because cutting off money uh, is extremely important. Um, and sometimes we're going to have to start calling a spade a spade and point out the dangers of Wahhabism and Salafism in the region, uh, and that won't be to be everybody's is uh, everyone's taste. And for the UK, what's our place? Well, we are the fifth biggest economy in the world. We are, we are hugely dependent on global stability for trade. Uh, and if we are going to be dependent for our income and our wealth on that global stability, we have to recognize we have an obligation to help uh, at least it, as far as our part is concerned to play that. Um, and the idea, especially in an increasingly globalized environment, that you can opt out of your international security obligations is profoundly absurd. Lord Richards? Um, well, I'll try to run through them. Um, Tim Fish, have we got enough time? I just echo what uh, Dot Fox said. Um, my instinct is not, uh, but there may have been, I think there was quite a lot of work done um, already. So I know there are people, friends of mine in the audience, who will, uh, as Liam said, who can probably answer that better. So, uh, Will Jessick, go and talk to this chap at the end. Um, RCDS, uh, how do we establish our position in the world, Johnny? Well, I, I think it's a really important question. Um, where I, uh, it was the one I was trying to get at uh, myself um, a little bit. I think confidence has been knocked um, quite considerably after Iraq and to a degree Afghanistan. By the way, I should have said on the issue of Afghanistan that ISIS is now in Afghanistan the degree of which, to which we don't really know. A very good role Britain and our other allies can play is to prevent Afghanistan from going down the tube um, uh, before doing anything in um, necessarily, although I would want to do uh, a lot myself, uh, before doing anything in the context of Iraq uh, and Syria. It's very important that we don't um, chuck our gains as limited as some of you might think they are, away in Afghanistan. Um, we need to look after Afghanistan and, and keep them um, in, the, in the body of nations, so to speak. Um, but I think, Johnny, going back to you, that less may equal more. Um, that, and I, I, I don't know, but my instinct is that we are doing too much around the world uh, in little teams, and what we need to do is less 
but more effectively, uh, where we can gain real strategic traction for our efforts. And I mentioned the 200 advisors, trainers, and so on going to Afghanistan, I'm uh, sorry, to Iraq. That just is not enough to gain strategic effect uh, for us in the region uh, and, and uh, more specifically in Iraq and in the battle against ISIS. So I would strip out some of the others because bearing in mind, please, that it is operational success that gives the uh, armed forces our influence and Britain our influence. It's not lots of training missions. They're valuable, but at the end of the day, if you don't win wars and are seen to be bloody good on operations, it doesn't really matter. So that's where I would uh, think I would look for a, uh, a solution to some of the points that you're getting at. Um, I didn't really hear, I apologize, the question that you point. Maybe, do you want to say it again or did you get it? Do you just want to summarise it in a sentence? Quickly, uh, uh, yes, yes, very quickly. Uh, it was about public opinion uh, it, and uh, the, the politicians being prepared to defend defence uh, 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 because it's not necessarily a vote winner. Uh, and that was, okay. that was addressed. Okay. I think the, the mood in America, I think, is affecting that. It's not the, the administration over the past few years has, has not really, I mean... Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, got the point. Yeah, I, 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 it's a good point, and Michael Arthur asked a similar point. Uh, I, I agree with you, and, and like Liam said very articulately, they need to lead. Um, and we are, we are, we've been told by, I'm sure, a Prime Minister who absolutely means it, that ISIS, for example, is the struggle of our generation. What I want to see is the strategy that will deliver on that vision. And I don't see any of that yet. I'm sure it will be delivered. Uh, he's given very clear instructions, but we're not very good at it. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of reasons uh, why, and I could offer solutions. Um, cyber security, Laura mentioned, uh, I think, I didn't get into specific capabilities, but you're absolutely right to raise it. Um, uh, it, it needs a whole ramping up of effort. I'm sure the SDSR will do that. They'll examine uh, cyber and uh, uh, come up with better solutions. And the High Commissioner of Cyprus, um, well, history, I'm afraid, is replete, uh, sadly, with uh, people that are surprised. Uh, I have to say that uh, some of us, um, and uh, I'm sure three of us are sitting at the table, maybe you did too, Ben, uh, did warn that if we didn't deal decisively with uh, President Assad back in 2011-2012 uh, and were not seen to support the opposition groups properly, um, then more and more people would be drawn to the extremist organisations al-Nusra and now ISIS. So people said it, but I have to say... Um, our uh, strategic leaders did not buy the case, and uh, if only they had. Because I'm conscious, as a guy like all of you, uh, I've, I've always had a moral streak, which sometimes surprises people that soldiers do. Actually, it is, um, an, it is a great shame, something we should be ashamed of, that we could have nipped this problem in the bud four years ago, but failed to do so, and now millions of Syrians, and maybe many more, are going to have their lives ruined because we failed to do what we could have done. But, but it, we're still going to be surprised. Yeah, we're bound to be surprised, but we've got to have the capabilities. We've got to have the flexibility in order to be able uh, to do with that. I've never used the, the words punching above your weight. I, 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 it's meaningless. And, and, it, and it, it gave false reassurance in this country to people that you could have a small defense budget and you could still stride the world stage. We need to decide what it is needs to be protected and then we need to decide and it's a political decision an overall political decision about what resources we're going to devote to it the dangers are manifest they are there if we've got a contribution to make uh, we should uh, we should make it um i think one of the you know i've come to the conclusion i must say having thought a lot about it that the main threat that we face today um is ourselves you know we we are our own worst enemy we simply ignore problems. We look at a to-do list with all the things that I listed at the beginning, and it looks too complicated, it looks too difficult, so we go and do something else. You know, we do that at home, we do it in our business life, it's exactly the same, and that's why we're closing our eyes to it. And unless people are convinced that there are things worth fighting for, then we'll be in more trouble. 
We're faced with ISIS now. It's, it's a headline issue. It's horrifying. We know more about it because people are coming out and television cameras are going in there. But we had a chance. The House of Commons had a chance in 2013 to do something about it. And our Prime Minister came to the House of Commons to persuade the House of Commons to take a military decision. And we chose not to do it. If anything encouraged ISIS at that point, it was that decision. And I tell you, if anything encouraged President Putin yep. to do what he did in Crimea, yep. it was the fact of a failure of will yep. on the part of the Western powers at that moment in Syria that perhaps convinced them that it was going to be relatively easy to do what he actually did. Now, the Cyprus High Commissioner says, well, we could foresee these things. Well, some we can foresee and some we can't. But can I make a point to you? I am no longer the NATO Secretary General. I am no longer the Secretary of State for Defence. I'm just an ordinary citizen, or perhaps a member of the House of Lords who doesn't have, have to face the electorate. If your country, Mr High Commissioner, would do something about the links between NATO and the European Union, which are hung up on the issue of Cyprus, then we could get the Berlin Plus arrangements that link the EU and NATO together and would give us a lot more flexibility, a lot more firepower, a lot more diplomatic clout, and a bigger contribution to dealing with the problems of the world today. I probably couldn't have said that to you <laughs> in as blunt terms when I was actually holding office. As long as Cyprus joins NATO, that's There we go. Well, thanks. thanks well, well, sorry, just, just, the, just finally on, on the question of public opinion. <laughs> People only buy burglar alarms if they believe there's a chance of being robbed by a burglar. And unless politicians actually talk about the risks, the public will not be willing to contemplate the spending we require for our security. And of all the phrases beloved by the Treasury, punching above your weight is one of their favorite because it implies you can get security on the cheap. And uh, if I could make one plea, it's that, can you please banish that phrase from your lexicon for the future? Well, could I make three points in conclusion? I mean, um, I'd say that the panel have certainly punched strategically and been very strategic, <laughs> strategic, strategic in their, in their um, points that they've made, uh, which have all complemented each other very well. I'd like to actually thank those of you who've asked questions because they, you kept them crisp and also many of them reached parts that we hadn't been able to reach from the, from the panel in, in, initially. Um, I'd also say that um, on our website, the Institute has... Um, some substantive commentary and analysis of many of the issues that have been um, addressed this evening, particularly um, ISIS, NATO, and um, cy cyber issues. And there, there's much to explore there if you're particularly interested, interested with them. I'd also like to thank the three panellists. In part, I had a feeling of great trepidation because as a lowly retired brigadier, I had at various times in my previous career been um, under command of each of them but they've been very restrained and haven't pulled rank at all, for which I'm very grateful. But uh, would you please join me in showing your appreciation?